Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second Archimedean stop of the term. Today, we are very happy to have with us Dr. Benoit Becedo from University of York. Dr. Becedo did his undergrad and PhD in Cambridge here. Today, he works in quantum and classical integrable systems. And today, he'll be talking about classical and quantum duality. It's very great to have you here with us today. And I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's really a great pleasure to, to give this talk, especially as a former undergraduate student and PhD student in Cambridge. So what I want to tell you about is um, essentially some things I work on. So in particular, it's, it's an example of a classical quantum duality. So this is a very broad term which describes a certain type of duality. So I'll describe only a specific example in detail, which is something I work on called the ODIM correspondence. Okay, so just to start very um, generally, what, what is a duality? So a duality is essentially some um, relationship between two very different descriptions of the same object. So it's some, there's some underlying object which is described in two separate ways, and we say that these two descriptions are dual to each other. So uh, the example I like to give, uh, the heuristic example I like to give is of two schools of philosophers. So the first one is very fond of circles. They, they like to um, think of circles. They know essentially everything you need to know about circles. And then the other school likes rectangles and they essentially know everything you can possibly want to know about a rectangle. But then one day they realize that actually they're both interested in the same object, namely a cylinder. So the guys who think about rectangles, they're thinking about it from the side and then the others are thinking about it viewed from the top. So they're thinking about the same thing, but from different perspectives. So that's essentially at the heart what a duality is. It's two different ways of seeing the same thing. So there's a very nice example in maths, which you may all have come across already, which is um, dual graphs. So a graph is just a set of um, vertices and edges, um, and they form faces. And what you can do is you can think of it completely differently by, instead of thinking of the vertices as the vertices, you can think of the faces as the vertices. And then the edges connecting two faces are the edges connecting those vertices. And um, the vertices themselves become the faces of the new graph. So you get this way a new graph, which is dual to the original one. So it's a different description of the same thing, right? It's two different ways of seeing the same thing. So you either think of the vertices as vertices or you think of the faces as vertices. So you're swapping the roles of vertices and faces. So what I'll talk about today is a duality in physics rather. Um, which is really relating um, the classical regime of, of physical theories and the quantum regime. So to really understand what a kind of classical quantum duality is, it's useful to recall what the usual relationship is between classical and quantum theories. So roughly speaking, the quantum theory depends on this um, parameter h bar. And what it does is it describes the microscopic behavior of, of a physical system. And uh, when you take the h bar goes to zero limit, you're essentially zooming out and looking at the macroscopic behavior of the same system. And that's um, nicely described by the classical system, by the same, same theory, but in the classical limit. So um, essentially to get a classical solution, what you should look, like, look at is a very many particle system in the quantum theory. And when you look at the h bar goes to zero limit, these many particle states essentially end up describing a classical solution. So that's the usual relationship between quantum and classical. And the example I want to look at today is uh, a duality between classical and quantum theories. Namely, you have two theories, one is classical and one is quantum. Uh, the classical one depends on h bar, but just as a parameter, there's just this parameter in the game, just some, some number, which um, the theory depends on. And the quantum theory has h bar as the quantum deformation parameter. And the idea will be that um, even if this theory B has nothing to do with the theory A, you can use the classical theory B to tell you something about quantum states in the theory A. So in the example I'll talk about, in fact, A and B will be the same theories. So I'll use classical theory to describe um, essentially the, st uh, states, the eigenvalues of different operators on certain states in the quantum theory of the same theory, really. Okay. So this will be the sort of um, the goal today is to describe it an instance of this kind of duality where classical solutions of a given classical theory can tell you something about the quantum states in a quantum theory. Okay. Uh, by the way, please interrupt me if you have questions at any point. Okay, so the example I look at is, um, is an integrable field theory. So I'll describe what that means um, as we go along. But uh, to begin with, um, this classical theory is, is Kotovec de Vries theory, KDV theory for short. And what it describes is shallow water waves in one plus one dimensions. So one plus one is space and time. So I denote these as X and T. 
And the field of the theory is U, and so you can think of this as the height of the wave, okay? So it's, it's describing shallow water waves, U is the height, it depends on X and T. And the equation governing the, the profile of the waves is this KDV equation. So it has, uh, so the time dependent term, but then these two terms, which are crucial to describe this theory and to make it integrable. So the first is this nonlinear term, which makes this equation hard to solve. And there's the dispersion term, so you can think about what, what would happen if you remove either of these terms, what kind of solutions you could expect. So if you remove the dispersion term, what will happen is that if you start from a given profile, then the, um, so the points in the wave which are high will tend to move faster than the points which are lower. And the effect of the absence of a dispersion term will cause the waves to break typically. So if you evolve this blue profile under the equations without the dispersion term, you'll find that the wave breaks. So you get this singularity. Uh, on the opposite end, if you remove the nonlinear term, what happens is uh, just under the dispersion term, what happens is the wave disperses. So if you take the same profile and evolve it in time without the nonlinear term, essentially the wave spreads out and disperses um, in, in space. Okay. So um, the effect of both terms together, what, what this allows is to have sort of these two effects compensate each other. And you can have in the KDV equation where both terms are present, you can have um, solutions which sort of keep their shape and move um, um, at a constant velocity in time. So these are called one soliton solutions. Okay, so this is a really remarkable solution, which uh, you see depends just um, in the usual way as uh, linear waves do for a linear wave equation. They depend on x minus vt, where v is any velocity v. And um, the profile is a very special profile. So if you start off with this profile at a given time, the, the wave will keep that shape and just move at a constant speed in time. Okay. So these waves were actually first observed uh, in nature by uh, John Scott Russell, a Scottish civil engineer. So he described them in a famous paragraph, which you can read online on Wikipedia on his page. Uh, he described them as um, a wave on a canal, which he followed on, on a horseback, and he actually followed the wave for uh, two to three kilometers. So it really um, impressed him, the, the way the wave kept its shape. And here you see some uh, physicists in Edinburgh, I think, recreating the, the wave on, on a similar canal. Okay. So the... Um, the theory I'll be interested in is KDV on a circle. So it's, it's sort of an unphysical modification of the theory because it doesn't really describe waves um, on a canal anymore because I'm going to make the, the real line periodic, the space direction I'm going to make periodic. But what I want to tell you here is that you can still find solutions of the KDV equation on a circle because you can find periodic solutions on the real line. So this is an example of a periodic solution of the KDV equation. So it's built out of these um, elliptic cosine functions um, and and the period is given by this elliptic um, integral of the first kind. So um, these solutions really just look the same as before, it's just that you have um, a periodicity introduced into the solution. Okay, so they depend on these parameters beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, the velocity being the sum of all of them. And you can recover the, um, the one soliton solution by taking the limit when beta 1 goes to beta 2. So the waves will then spread out and you'll just get left with one wave in the middle. Okay. So these are also observed in nature. So here's um, an example of a picture from, I think, uh, so I can't remember when, when this was taken, but you see um, shallow water waves on the coast of Panama, and you see this uh, sort of one direction, which is the direction um, perpendicular to all the waves. Uh, and these are essentially conoidal waves that I just described. And then you also have these uh, solutions of a rel related equation, which is the KP equation, which is one dimension higher. So you really have in this case sort of waves which collide in two dimensions. It's a similar type of solutions, but they sort of, they live in two dimensions now, X and Y, and then there's a time component. Okay. So why is this in equation so interesting and why does it support such remarkable solutions? So it comes down to the fact that it has an infinite number of conserved quantities. You can build from the KDV equation an infinite number of conserved um, quantities, which uh, are integrals of motion. So uh, you can construct them essentially by hand, uh, just by rewriting the KDV equation in different ways. So if you um, rewrite the KV, KDV equation in this way, you can very easily see that the integral of u will be conserved in time because the total derivative will disappear when you integrate over all space. 
Um, similarly, you can build more, more interesting integrals of motion by multiplying the KDV equation first by 2u and then rearranging it in this form. And then again, you see that u squared, when you integrate it over space, will become an integral of motion. It will not depend on time. Okay. And you can keep going like this, playing with the KDV equation to by hand construct all these integrals of motion. Okay, so the claim is that there is an infinite number of them. They're called I subscript and odd number 2n plus 1. And here I've written the, the fifth one. So um, when you see this, uh, you should ask yourself, well, is it possible to find a systematic way of building these integrals of motion rather than just building them um, one by one? And indeed, there's this general formalism called the lax formalism which I'll describe in the case of the KDV theory. And so what you start with is what's called the lax connection. So it's just a here matrix valued, two by two matrix valued connection uh, on, on the, um, the, ax, the real axis or the circle labeled by X. So it depends on the KDV field and also on this formal parameter lambda. Okay, so you can think of lambda as a formal parameter or as a complex number. Uh, so this matrix here, I, I'll call L of U lambda. And the point is that there's another matrix called M of U lambda, which is more complicated. It's not really relevant. But the pair of these form a connection in two dimensions, uh, one plus one dimensions. And the flatness of this connection is equivalent to the KDV equation. Okay, so this is identically in, in the parameter lambda. So for every value of the parameter lambda, you recover the KDV equation. So because this holds for all lambda, you could ask, why did I choose to put the parameter in anyway? Why could I just set it to one? And the reason is because the parameter is useful for building integrals of motion, this infinite number of integrals of motion. So specifically, because we have a flat connection formed of L and M, what we can do is integrate it uh, or form the path ordered exponential because this is a non-abelian connection. So you form the path ordered exponential, let's say around the cylinder, if you're looking at KDV on a circle or along the rail axis um, if you're looking at KDV on the line. And the point is that this guy will actually be conserved in, in the case of the plane and its trace will be conserved in the case of the cylinder. So you can easily show that by some non-abelian version of Stokes theorem that this guy is conserved by virtue of the fact that the um, connection is flat. Okay. So um, to be able to extract uh, intervals of motion from this, uh, you need to expand in, in lambda. But because this is a non-abelian connection, it's hard to work with this path of the, this path of the exponential. So it's useful to try and find a gauge uh, for the connection where the, um, um, the component L at least becomes abelian. Okay. So if you can do that, then uh, the, your path of the exponential will reduce to just an exponential. Okay. So the goal is to try and find a gauge in which the um, lax connection becomes abelian in which case we'll be able to extract integrals of motion quite easily from this, um, this path ordered exponential, which will become an exponential. Okay. Um, so such a gauge is relatively easy to find by working order by order in Lambda. So namely you can find the gauge transformation parameter, which is the exponential of some formal Taylor series in Lambda, where the coefficients of some functions of X and um, building it order by order in Lambda, you can actually bring this, um, connection to the following uh, canonical form. So it depends just on one function, which is a function of X and Lambda. It's a Laurent series expansion in Lambda with coefficients, which are functions of X. Okay. So it has this leading order Lambda inverse because you started with Lambda inverse in the lax connection. But the point is that you can, uh, this U, U of X Lambda, you can sort of distribute it evenly among the two coefficients, which are off diagonal to, by using this gauge transformation to bring the connection to this abelian form. So now because it's just a, a function times a constant matrix, uh, it's, it's, an, it's an abelian connection. And so we have now um, a way of extracting the integrals of motion just by reading off essentially the coefficients of this, this, um, this Taylor expansion J. So it turns out that J is actually not unique. Uh, you can still modify it by doing a residual gauge transformation, which keeps it in this form. But the um, residual gauge transformation just changed J's by some total derivatives. Okay, so, um, so that's okay, because remember that what we're doing is we, we want to integrate the connection, right? So we're only interested in the integral of the connection. And because um, J is defined only up to a total derivative, that's fine. If we integrate this um, component, we'll just get um, a uniquely defined object. 
So it turns out that um, these objects, which you can construct by abelianizing the KDV lax connection, are exactly the integrals of motion or the densities of the integrals of motion I talked about before. So if you integrate this uh, J2n plus one over the space, which is either your circle or the real line, you're going to get something which is proportional to the charges I told you about before, I2n plus one. Okay. So um, by construction, these will all be conserved. And um, so what I'll be interested in is KDV theory on the circle. So as I said, you can do this on the circle just as well as on the real line. So I'll take this C CT to be the circle. And what that means is you're just working with the KDV equation where you um, periodically identify the fields um, with period two pi. Okay, so we're looking for um, solutions of the KDV equation um, with period two pi. And you can construct integrals of motion in exactly the same way as before. You just have to integrate over the circle. So these are infinitely many integrals of motion of the KDV equation on the circle. Okay. So it would be important to remember this procedure, how to construct the integrals of motion for later. Okay, so there's this abelianization procedure, which um, produces this function, which is a Laurent series in lambda, and each coefficient is defined up to a total derivative, which then once integrated gives you well-defined um, objects which match with the integrals of motion of KDV theory. Okay, are there any questions up to this point? Okay, so um, to, to quantize the theory, so I'll be interested in quantizing KDV theory on the circle. Um, and ultimately, I'll try to tell you how to describe the spectrum of that quantum theory in terms of a classical um, KDV theory. So um, um, when you, to quantize, we need the Poisson brackets. So um, the, it turns out that the, there are multiple Poisson brackets you can put on the KDV field to reproduce the KDV equation. But uh, a nice one, which I'll use today, is the following second KDV bracket. So the field now just depends on the, um, the spatial coordinate, which is S1, uh, because I'm in the Hamiltonian framework, and the Poisson bracket is this one. So it's um, got a term proportional to the derivative of the delta distribution, um, which is linear in the, uh, in the KDV field, and a third derivative of the delta function, which, is, um, which will be important later. Okay, so with this bracket, you can take the integrals of motion we found before, and you can um, construct the corresponding um, flows or the corresponding symmetries induced by these conserved quantities via Noether's theorem. So if you take I1, what you get is translation in space. Um, so you can easily see from this bracket, if you integrate on, on X here, you're going to basically get the, the derivative of the field U up to some factor. And I3 is the Hamiltonian of the KDV theory because um, when you take the Poisson bracket with I3, what you get is the time derivative of the KDV field. So this really here is just the KDV equation rewritten in Hamiltonian form using this second KDV bracket. So I'm saying that the Hamiltonian of KDV theory with respect to this second KDV bracket is just I3. Okay. So um, now that we have this Poisson bracket, we can express the conservation laws um, in terms of it. So namely, because time evolution is just given by Poisson bracket with I3, uh, to say that these um, I two n minus one are integrals of motion is just to say that they pass on commute with I three. Okay, so that's just the time evolution of I I two n minus one, which is zero. Okay, and in fact, more is true. It turns out that in fact all these things pass on commute with each other. So uh, not just I three commutes with all of them, but they all commute with each other. And what's that? What that's telling you is that the symmetries which are induced by these conservation uh, integrals of motion the symmetries form an abelian symmetry algebra. Namely, if you write delta n for the, um, the symmetry induced by the um, integral of motion i two n minus one by the Poisson bracket, then the commutator of these two symmetries by the Jacobi identity, you can relate it to this Poisson bracket and therefore it vanishes. So the commutator is zero. So these, this is an infinite dimensional symmetry algebra which underlies the KDV theory. So all these local integrals of motion, they're local because they're just integrals of densities these are um, these form an infinite dimensional abelian symmetry algebra, and this is the hallmark of an integrable sy uh, system, in particular an integrable field theory. And so that's why we say that the KDV theory is a classically integrable field theory. Okay. So what I want to describe now is how to quantize this theory, and once I've quantized it, I'll then tell you how to describe the spectrum using classical KDV theory again. What do you mean by the hidden symmetry here then? Well, they're, they're hidden because they're not sort of um, manifest. You have to, um, I mean, 
they're not global symmetries. Um, like translation symmetries is an obvious global symmetry, but this is um, the sort of, um, they're complicated to describe because they're sort of, um, um, well, it's not, it's not a global symmetry of the KDV equation. So, Right, then how would you like usually think about these symmetries? Or... Well, they're not physical. I mean, they're, they're, they're ways of rewriting the equation, um, but it's a, it's a comp they're complicated transformations on the KDV field. They're not really easy to describe explicitly. It's not going to be relevant here. Um, okay. But so I say it's hidden in the sense that um, they're not global symmetries. That's what I mean. Right. Okay. 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 Any other questions? Do they still relate to shallow water waves? Um, not anymore because I'm not on the on, on the line. I'm on the circle, so it's less it's less physical. On the actual globe, we're on the circle, no? Yes, that's true. Um, if you like, I, I describe for you periodic solutions on 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 water, which is which is not periodic. So you can have periodic solutions, and solutions of the KDV equations on the circle would correspond to periodic solutions on the line. But I wouldn't say that, I mean, these are, these are ways which, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I would think of these as solutions of um, water waves on, on the surface of the earth. I don't know if that. Like before God created land. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is really unphysical, an unphysical theory. I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to put any physical meaning behind this theory. It, it, it's an interesting mathematical theory, as you'll see, because you can solve it exactly, and and you can quantize it and find the spectrum exactly. But where it's related to physical systems, I wouldn't know. Can you do similar things on a sphere? Well, I'm in, I'm in one plus one dimensions, so it's really the circle I'm talking about. For the sphere, you'd have to work in two dimensions, and I'm, I'm not doing that. So integrable field theories are typically one dimensional, one space dimensional. Um, so um, there's this other related system I told you about, which is KP equations, which is two dimensional, two plus one dimensional. And I don't know if it's been um, studied on non-trivial um, topologies like the sphere. Um, certainly on the plane, but not on the sphere, I don't think so. But here I'm in one dimension, so it's, yeah, the sphere wouldn't ev even, um, apply. Okay. Okay, any other questions before I try to quantize the theory? Okay, so um, we have KDV theory described by this classical Poisson bracket, and what I want to tell you about is how to quantize the theory. So what I'll, I'll do is just tell you the answer and then explain to you why that is quantizing KDV theory. So what you should look at is this thing called the vera Sur algebra, which is very important algebra in conformal field theory. And so it's generated by these operators ln, labeled by the integers uh, n. And the commutation relations of this quantum algebra are given as follows. So uh, there's this central extension term, which um, you wouldn't see if you, for example, try to compute the Lie brackets between two vector fields on the circle. So uh, I claim that the Verisor algebra is a central extension of this algebra of uh, the Lie algebra of vector fields on the circle, which are these guys. Uh, in the sense that if you try to compute the Poisson bracket of two guys like this, you'll get the first term, but not the central extension term. So this is a, a, a quantum uh, central extension of um, the Lie algebra of um, vector fields on the circle. Okay, so I can rewrite this in terms of fields, and namely I can build a field T of X, which is a quantum operator, which is essentially given by the Fourier modes ln. So it's, it's Fourier decomposition is given as follows. And this is here a reason why I'm, I'm interested in the circle because I can write my fields as Fourier decompositions like this. So my fields are essentially described by an infinite number of modes which are labeled by the integers. So in terms of this operator T, um, this Vera Sur algebra is written in the following way. And now you can start to recognize the um, Poisson bracket of the KDV theory, it's just being quantized. So the claim is that if you identify h bar with minus six over the central extension c and you take the limit h bar goes to zero while fixing h times the operator t and you call that the the field u and then you um, um, replace the commutator divided by one over h bar by the Poisson bracket 
then what you find is that the field U satisfies the uh, second KDV bracket. So this is really the quantization of the second KDV bracket where H bar is related to the central charge C. Okay. So it's in this sense that um, the virus R algebra describes quantum KDV theory on the circle. So from now on, I'll essentially describe the spectrum of the virus R algebra on different um, um, representations. So the point is once you've quantized the algebra of observables, what you want to talk about is the Hilbert space. Um, so first let me talk about certain special integrals of motion. So remember I1 was the integral of, of U. And so I have the quantum I1, which is the integral of T. So that will be an important operator late, later. It's just L naught shifted by some constant. And the Hamiltonian of KDV theory, remember, was I3, which was the integral of u squared. So it has this explicit expression in the quantum case. You take the normal order version of this operator, T squared, and you integrate it on the circle, and that gives you the operator I3, which has this mode expression. And so then you could write down the quantum KDV equation, which would just be the same as the Poisson um, bracket of I3 uh, with U1, with you, sorry, to give a derivative of u with respect to t, but it's for the operator t now, capital T. So the commutator of, of the quantum operator I3 with t gives me the time evolution of the operator t. So this is the quantum KDV equation. Okay. Um, so I also have this uh, higher um, series of integrals of motions. So they, they quantize the I2 and minus ones I talked about before, which I told you how to construct. Turns out that these are much harder to construct. Uh, but there's still a systematic recursive procedure for building them. And they have quantum corrections. So they depend on this C, which is, remember, related to H bar. So there are quantum corrections to the, to the expressions for these classical I2 and minus ones. But the thing is that they still commute. So just as the classical versions Poisson commuted, their quantizations, and that's why you need to introduce some quantum corrections, is to ensure that they still commute in the quantum theory. So this commutator is the commutator of the Verisor algebra. And these guys uh, form a, an infinite um, dimensional commutative subalgebra of the Verisor algebra. Okay. So we have a large number of conserved quantities, an infinite number of them. And the goal will be to try and simultaneously diagonalize on the Hilbert space of the theory. So what's, what do I take for the space of states? So because my um, field, the KDV field, once it's quantized, it's just a Verisor operator, I just need to look at representations of the Verisor algebra. So I'm looking at representations of these LNs, of the algebra of the LNs. And what I can do is look at highest weight representations. So I take a number delta and I, I um, define a state delta, um, angle bracket delta, to be basically uh, to have eigenvalue uh, delta under L naught and to be annihilated by all the raising operators, all the LNs for N positive. So this is my highest weight. And then I can build the entire Hilbert space or representation of the reverse algebra by um, inducing down by acting with all the L minus Ns for N positive. So I lower as many times as I want with as many operators as I, as I want. So if you're familiar with Fox spaces, this is similar, but it's, it's a sort of non-abelian version because the LNs don't commute with each other. So the order does matter, but you can still induce a representation of the Verisor algebra in this way by starting from a highest weight um, state, which, is, which has these properties. Okay, so the representation is labeled by C, which was the central charge of the Verisor algebra, and this new number delta, which is the weight of the, of the highest weight, okay, of the vacuum state. Um, so um, I can look at the eigenspaces of this um, operator L0, and it, it gives me basically these states which are a certain um, depth below the vacuum. So I have a, a, a number L, which is the eigenvalue of L0, or rather delta plus L is the eigenvalue of L0, and I can break my, my vector space, my infinite dimensional vector space V into uh, finite dimensional subspaces, which are essentially labeled by the extra um, variable L, which is an integer which labels the depth below the vacuum. Okay, so that's sort of the structure of the, of the st space of states. Okay, so the goal will be to simultaneously diagonalize all these commuting operators. So they simultaneously, they commute, so I can simultaneously diagonalize them on this representation. And because um, they also commute with L0, um, what I can do, in fact, is just uh, rep um, look at the um, action on these subspaces, finite dimensional subspaces of a given depth. Okay, because they commute with um, I0, 
or sorry, I, I1, which is L0, um, I can look at the diagonalization of these operators on these finite dimensional subspaces, which is more convenient. So I can look, look depth by depth, okay? So I'm gonna try to um, uh, describe the eigenvalues of these infinite family of commuting operators on the various subspaces of different depth L. Okay. So the, uh, I'll, I'll describe now how to do that using classical KDV theory, but I'll need some slight modification of classical KDV theory. So namely what you should look at is if you remember the procedure I told you about for constructing um, integrals of motion of classical KDV theory, I told you you should look at the, the Lax connection. So what I'll start with is the, uh, the Lax connection of some form of twisted KDV. So, so it's even a further um, sort of extension away from physics. This is a very hypothetical system where KDV has been twisted in the following way. So in the Lax connection, I just replace lambda by this function p, which is z to the k times z minus one, to the minus one power, minus one half power. So I just scale lambda by this, this factor, but it's the same connection as before, except for this change, okay? So in particular, notice that this is a multi-valued function because it involves square roots, and k could also be a non-integer. So this has branch points at zero and one, okay? So I can relate this back to normal KDV, or at least as a normal KDV connection. Uh, and also I should mention that this is a connection now on C. So I'm not looking at KDV theory on the line, it's really KDV theory, which is on the complex plane. C is a complex coordinate, okay? So I can relate this back to at least the classical form of the KDV connection where I remove the P's by uh, changing coordinates from Z to some other coordinate, which is called X, which is defined as follows. So you take the integral of P to the half so this is a very complicated um, transformation, but what it does is something very nice. It, um, for example, transforms the upper half plane on, in the Z coordinates. So remember, P has branch points at zero and one. Uh, so you have these branch cuts along, let's say along the real axis between zero and infinity and one and infinity. And um, the upper half plane is mapped under this transformation to the X plane. Which this is just another coordinate uh, in the complex plane, it maps the entire upper half plane to the interior of this triangle, where the three edges are essentially given by the three pieces of the real axis. The two cuts in, in blue and red, and there's the segment zero and between zero and one in blank. And the angles of this triangle are just related to the power of the branch point at zero and one. So in particular, the angle here is related to K, the angle at the image of the point zero, and the angle at the image of the point one is related to the, to the power one here. So the angles are coming from the, the choice of the function P. So th this choice of function I'm, I made because it's gonna be able to describe for me the spectrum of quantum KDV3. It, the choice is for a specific reason. Okay. Uh, and I'll relate later the parameter K to the, to the data of the quantum KDV equation. Okay. So I have this, this twisted form of KDV and I'm just telling you that I can relate it back to normal KDV theory just by changing coordinates in the complex plane. So namely, the claim is that this class, uh, this twisted version of classical KDV theory, um, whose um, Lax connection has this form, which lives on this on the upper half plane or, or on the whole plane with some cuts, I can map it to the triangle, and it now looks like the normal KDV equation in this new coordinate x. But the price to pay is that um, this u, which will be rational, would now be a multi-valued function on the x-plane. Okay. So p is multi-valued, but u will be rational. Uh, but then when I do this transformation, the KDV field u on the x-plane now turns out to be multi-valued. Okay. So in particular, as you go around these branch points, um, you basically don't never come back to the same value. Okay. Or not in general. Okay, so the, the thing I'll work with is this twisted form of KDV, but I just wanted to show you that you can actually relate it back to normal KDV with this fa fancy change of coordinates, which maps the plane to some triangle. Okay. Uh, with the schwarz christoffel transformation, we can map it to a polygon. So yeah. why are you mapping it to a triangle? No, in my, in my case, it's a triangle because um, I'm looking at this special function P. In general, as you're right, if P has more branch points, it will be a polygon. And I'll come back to this later as another example. But in this case, I, ma I made this special choice of P. And so there's two branch points. As, and as I said, 
these two branch points get mapped to two of the vertices of the triangle and the other branch point at infinity um, gets mapped to the third vertex. So that's why I have a triangle. Does that make sense? It's just because of my special choice of P. Are you using the, the geometry of the triangle? Mm. Are you going to use them? Not so much. As I said, I'll work mostly with this version of the KDV theory, which is twisted. But you can, if you want, think of uh, rather KDV theory on the, this triangle. So as I said, it's not really the triangle because um, I'll, you'll see in a second, um, it's actually um, multiple copies of the triangle tessellating the plane. Because as I move out of this triangle, I move into another triangle, which is sort of the lower half plane. And as I keep going around the branch cuts, I move into new triangles. So it's not really a triangle, it's a sort of a tessellation of the plane by triangles. Yeah, I'll come back to that. But so I won't really use the geometry of the cycle, but you can, you can think of the classical solutions I'm describing as living on the, on the triangle with some sort of uh, multi-valuedness as you cross the edges. Uh, and this is just standard KDV on the triangle, or if you prefer, you can think of it as twisted version of KDV on the plane, which I prefer. It's, it's more elegant because U is rational in this case. It will be. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for the questions. Okay, so um, just as before, um, I told you that uh, if you have the lax connection, what you can do is you can bring it to this abelian form. And what that does for you is it allows you to build the integrals of motion of the theory. So I'll do the same thing here. It's just that now my lax connection is slightly more complicated, but I can still do the same thing of bringing the connection to this abelian form. So I claim that there exists a gauge transformation, which is similar to what we saw before. Again, just lambda is um, twisted by this uh, half power of P, okay? So this gauge transformation brings my connection to this um, abelian form, which now um, I, I've written the coefficient as P of Z and lambda, little p. So it has this uh, LoRa expansion in lambda where the leading term has this uh, multi-valued function P and every coefficient has a power of P in it, okay? But the point is, uh, as before, these guys are not quite single, uh, are not quite uniquely defined. So I can um, I can still transform this and keep the same form. So I have some residual gauge transformation, which preserve this form but modify p slightly. And the way they modify it is under control because they modify it just by some total derivative of um, this expression here. So if I take my p's and multiply them by these powers of z, which is what appears here, okay. These are P's multiplied by some power of this capital P. Um, these guys are single valued up to a total derivative of some multi-valued function, which is again, some rational function of V uh, of Z um, times this multi-valued function. So now remember that the way we got rid of the derivative was by integrating along this, the, the line or along the circle. So now the question is, what should I integrate along to get rid of these derivatives? So because the, it's a derivative of a multi-valued function, I have to be very careful to choose a contour along which the, the function goes back to the same value. Okay, so I need a curve along which such functions have univalued branches. Okay, and this is given, for example, in this case, by what's called the Pockhammer contour. So if you take this, cur this curve, you see that it has zero winding number around one and around zero. And so for that reason, it, um, the function P comes back to the same value as you traverse the curve. Okay, and I can draw this in this uh, coordinate x. If I map this whole picture to the coordinate x, what happens is the following. So uh, let's say we start at this green dot here. I move in the upper half plane, so I'm moving along this triangle. But then when I reach the blue cut, I move across the blue edge of the triangle and I move into another copy of the triangle. So this is the thing I told you about before about this tessellation of the plane by triangles. So I, I move into a different triangle. Uh, so uh, I sort of have a, an extension of my uh, solution u to, to across the cut, which is just living on a different copy of the triangle in this x plane. And so the complete contour is traversing um, uh, a certain number of blue cuts and a certain number of red cuts, namely two of each, in such a way that when I come back to the, to the red cut, I have the same value as I had before for the function p. So the function p is single valued across this contour. Okay. So in particular, what that means, uh, is that I can now integrate my uh, densities, these guys, I can integrate them. And the derivative here vanishes because I, I chose a contour along which this function is single valued. 
So this is, if you like, the analog of the integrals of motion of classical KDV theory in the case of twisted KDV. My integrals of motion are given by these fancy integrals of some densities times these uh, multi-valued functions. Okay. So it's, it's a very far-fetched generalization of KDV, but it will be useful in describing the spectrum of um, KDV, quantum KDV theory on the circle. Namely, this is the, the claim. I can now tell you about the ODIM correspondence or some version of it, um, which is an instance of a classical quantum duality, namely for KDV theory. So the idea is the following. I'm looking at the joint spectrum of this commuting family of operators in quantum KDV theory. So this is, remember, a large commutative subalgebra of the Verus algebra. And I'm looking at that joint spectrum on a given eigenstate in some representation of the Verus algebra. So the representation is labeled by the central charge, which is a label of the Verus algebra. Delta was the highest weight of the representation and L was um, some level below the vacuum. So this is some finite dimensional vector space. So the claim is that this, this joint spectrum of these integrals of motion, the quantum integrals of motion is given by the uh, integrals of motion of um, rational solutions of twisted KDV theory, classical KDV theory, with a certain number of singularities, namely as many as the depth of the vector you're looking at. And so you can look at this as classical KDV theory with a twist or KDV theory on a triangle. Okay, so here I've drawn the two, um, the two upper, low, upper and lower half planes to be able to draw all the singularities. So I'm looking at KDV theory on this triangle or if you like on the upper half, on, on the plane um, uh, and I'm looking at rational solutions in the plane which become multi-valued on this triangle. Okay, so the, the remarkable conjecture is that if you act with these quantum operators on the state, the eigenvalue is just given by the corresponding classical integral of motion of some classical KDV solution which has a certain number of singularities and is rational okay so let me give you some examples so let's look at the vacuum state so the top state of the irreducible representation of the various algebra so um remember we had these two labels the central charge and the highest weight so what i do is i'm now going to relate to um the central charge this parameter k i had in the function capital p so remember p was um z to the k times z minus one. So k was sort of the um, order of the branch point at the origin. And it's directly related to the, to the central charge in this way. And the, um, the level of the highest weight or the, the weight of the highest weight delta is related to this parameter b, which enters this rational function. So I make this choice of rational function, which has just a singularity at one of the vertex of the triangle, but nothing inside. It's, it's um, holomorphic inside. And then uh, the claim is that if you act with the quantum operators of the KDV theory on the highest weight state, it's just given by the classical integrals of motion of this um, KDV profile. So you apply the procedure for constructing the integrals of motion of twisted KDV starting from this rational function u. And the things you find uh, for the integrals of motion are exactly the eigenvalues of these quantum operators on the vacuum state. Okay. So let's move on to the states one step, one step down. So now um, what you need to look at is solutions with one extra singularity inside the plane or in the triangle. So the solution is a bit more complicated. So I look at um, a fun rational function u of z of this form, where here phi is related to the logarithmic derivative of p. But the point is that there's this extra pole, which I'll describe in a second what it is. It's a very specially chosen point. But in terms of this rational solutions, uh, if I take this rational solution and apply the procedure I talked to you about before to construct the corresponding integrals of motion of twisted KDV, what I get are precisely the eigenvalues of these quantum integrals of motion on the state, which is one step down from the vacuum, L minus one acting on the state, okay? So you can guess that you can keep going like this. And um, First, oh yeah, let me tell you this point S, what it is. So it's a very specially chosen point. Namely, it's a solution of what are called the beta equations. Um, so these are the beta equations for one sing singularity. So I have one, one S and I need to introduce another beta root called T and I have this coupled system of algebraic equations between S and T. And if I solve these, um, I just forget about T, I don't need it. I just use S, I plug it into this um, expression. I get a rational solution, uh, a rational function. 
which I then build integrals of motion out of using the procedure I talked about. And these are integrals of motion on that state below the vacuum. The point is that there's only one solution to these equations. So there's a unique solution for S and T, namely, and in particular for S. So that corresponds to the fact that there's, a, there's just one state below the vacuum. Okay, so this single state is described by this unique solution of this form with the S being a solution of these beta equations. Okay, so you can keep going like this and you can look at two steps down below the vacuum at level two. So now you just take the same prescription as before, but you take um, so two copies of these extra singularities. So these were extra terms I added to the vacuum um, rational function. And now I take two copies of them. So I sum from i equals one to two, the same thing, but now there are two beta roots, S1 and S2. And the claim is that um, such a solution, when I apply the procedure, I get classical integrals of motion, which give me um, the eigenvalues of um, the quantum operators on these states at level two. So they're, they're labeled by J, which runs from one to two in principle, but there are some subtlety. So I'll talk about this um, now. So, um, so I have two bitter roots and they're both um, solutions of um, this system of four equations for four beta roots t1, t2, s1, s2. So again, I don't care about the beta root t, I just need s1 and s2. So if I can solve these equations, um, I take the solution for s1 and s2, I plug them into this formula, to this rational uh, function, I apply the, the machinery and I get um, the eigenvalues for um, the quantum operators on some state at level two below the vacuum, but which states? So this will depend on um, essentially the, the values of C and delta. So you might not have two solutions. So the number of solutions will depend on the parameters. And this has to do with the representation theory of the virus algebra, because what we're doing is we're really describing this, the spectrum of these quantum operators on some irreducible representation with this height weight, highest weight. And so in irreducible representation, some states might be missing or some combination of these states might be missing. And so you're basically going to describe um, all these states in the irreducible representations from all the solutions of the beta equations. Okay, so the, the claim is that the number of solutions of these beta equations corresponds to the number of states at level L below the vacuum uh, in the irreducible representation with this highest weight delta. Okay, so there's a very interesting connection between these solutions of algebraic equations and the representation theory of the virus algebra. Okay, so let me, uh, finally describe some um, far-fetched generalization of this story. So there is a growing number of examples of um, this conjecture, um, which goes by the name of the ODM correspondence or sometimes um, uh, uh, PDE IQFT correspondence more generally. So in general, the story is the following. So you have some integrable quantum field theory, which to be precise is, is of the form, um, which is called an affine Godin model. So this is a special type of integrable field theory. And they're labeled by some parameters, which are sort of levels of the um, Katz-Moody algebra from which the, this model is built. So these integrable quantum field theories, the claim is that the spectrum of their integrals of motion on some um, state in the um, uh, Hilbert space of the theory should be described by the um, integrals of motion of some classical solution of now um, affine Toda equations, not no longer KDV in general, but this affine Toda equation. And um, on some region, which is a polygon, which will depend on these parameters. So that the angles of the polygon um, will depend on the parameters K, which essentially you might guess from the question that was asked earlier, there's this generalization of the um, schwarz christoffel transformation, where you look at the P, which has um, Z minus ZI to the power KI product over I, and each of these branch points ZI has some multiplicity KI, which will be giving you the, uh, which will be related to the angle of the polygons under the schwarz christoffel transformation. So you're looking at solutions of affine to the theory on such polygonal regions. And the claim is that these um, integrals of motion, which you can build in a similar way to what I described before, starting from a solution of KDV theory on such a polygon, you can build integrals of motion for this theory. And um, these will be related to the eigenvalues of the um, of the integrable quantum field theory you're looking at, which isn't necessarily affine Toda in this case. So this is more general. But on this side, you always get affine Toda theory. This is the conjecture. So the list of integrable field theories which for which this conjecture has um, sort of been studied is growing, and there are many examples. In particular, 
quantum affine total theory has been studied in this way and many examples um, uh, as well. Okay. So to conclude, let me um, finish by saying that the, the hope or the, the expectation is that this is really a sort of um, duality in physics, which is a manifestation of some very deeper um, duality in mathematics, which goes by the name of the geometric Langlands duality. So I don't have time to explain in detail what this is. So this is a correspondence between two completely different objects in mathematics. So you have something called D modules on the um, moduli space of principal G bundles on some space X, on some complex curve X. And these D, D modules are in correspondence with um, sort of differential equations on the space X valued in the Langlands dual group. So these are called LG local systems. So this is a very general story. Um, and a special instance of this is when you focus on the complex curve being the, the Riemann sphere with some marked points at the ZIs. In that case, what you're describing on the D module side is the Hamiltonians of the Godin model. And these differential equations are what are called opairs for the Langlands dual algebra. And these are really similar to the Lax connection I told you about. So it's some simpler version of the Lax connection without a parameter lambda. Okay, and then the claim is that from these um, differential equations or from these differential operators, you can extract integrals of motion of the Hamiltonians of quantum, uh, quantum Godin model. Okay, so the, the Godin model has Hamiltonians which, pos uh, which commute between themselves. This is a quantum model. And this joint spectrum on a given eigenstate is given by um, um, our pairs in, in, in a similar way to what I described for KDV theory. You can extract the joint eigenvalues of these quantum operators from the, the differential operator. Okay, so this is a very nice example, I think, of a, the close interplay between dualities in maths and physics. So we're describing here duality in physics, which is between a classical theory and a quantum theory. In particular, we're interested in describing the spectrum of a quantum integrable field theory. And we see that it's sort of dual to um, the spectrum of a classical theory on some weird geometry. And this is, um, the hope is that this is closely related to this mathematical duality um, between two different objects in in maths, okay? So there are many um, extensions of this and um, uh, this is a very big area which is sort of currently under uh, investigation by many different people. So there's lots of further directions to take this into, but I'll stop here because I run out of time and I'll thank you for your attention. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Vesedo, for the talk. It was very enjoyable. Uh, I will take a few questions from the audience, so. Yeah. Meanwhile, one question I had was, uh, in, in your work, do you look a lot at this uh, D-module correspondence, um, like the geometric Langlands thing? Not, not so much the mathematical sign, but so I should say that the hope is that the ODM correspondence is an extension of the geometric Langlands correspondence to, not to, to curves, but to surfaces in, in complex, so complex surfaces, two-dimensional complex surfaces. So it's related to a generalization of the Langlands correspondence, which is not well understood. Um, I so I have looked at the, this correspondence in the case of a complex curve, which is intimately related to finite Godin models, which are very well understood. Hmm. But the, 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 this, the sort of physics duality I talked about is an extension to affine Godin models. And in particular, it's, it's some yet um, to be described generalization of the Langlands correspondence. So, I mean, I'm very interested in the mathematics as well. Uh, and for example, the way you get to this duality for the Godin model, one way to describe it is to start from the vertex algebra of a Katsumudi algebra, uh, and you look at its center at the critical level. And this is um, described in terms of uh, functions on the space of pairs. So this is essentially an instance of the Langlands correspondence. So it's not as I described it in terms of D modules and local systems, but it's, it's sort of a special case in the case of the, um, the curve being the, the plane. Um, but the thing to emphasize is really that what I've talked about is not directly related to the Langlands correspondence, but to some generalization, some higher dimensional generalization, yeah, which, which I don't think um, many people fully understand. Yeah. I see. Yeah. If there are no more questions, I would like to thank Dr. Vesero again. Thanks and thank much. you everyone for attending. <laughs>